Strangers, uh, to another episode of this strange life. Uh, I'm Mickey, the conduit between the freaks, the geeks, and I've got alongside me. Uh, what's he called, James? Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself because you don't like me calling you a novelist, really, do you? But I mean, that's what you are, right? Well, not, 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 not these days. No, it's a bit of a dirty word. But we have <laughs> we have uh, uh, we have three novelists today. Uh, myself, James Newitt, writes books, and uh, we have Mr. John Burdett. Um, uh, uh, author of the Somchai um, series of crime novels. How, what, there, there were five, weren't there? There's six. Uh, six. And it's Somchai. Somchai. <laughs> Somchai. So Somchai's the protagonist, is he? In, uh, yeah. He's, yeah, he's like he, a Lukrung um, detective. Which right. for our non a sort of Bangkok listeners is half half Thai, half Ferran. His, right? da- his dad yeah. was a Vietnam vet, uh, a, white, right. a white Vietnam vet. And his mum worked in a bar. And he's <laughs> very, what, a, what a start in life! <laughs> not an unusual combination. No, but he's a totally fair. Well, he's, he's, I, I'd say he's a totally fair kind of police officer, isn't he? Compared with most in the city, and that's kind of his charming. Uh, he, he's, he's fair. He's very connected to the internet. He's also a devout Buddhist. He's a complete man. He is. Wow. And we we also have Christopher G. Moore in uh, the room as well, who has written. I'm going to get this wrong as well. I'm going to say. 19. 20. I thought it was 27, but that was just no, from No, the... in the series, in the Vincent Calvino series. Okay, right. This is a little bit like a, 15, country, 15. a country auction. <laughs> can, can you give me 16? 16. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> 16 novels, and that's uh, spanning since uh, 92 or 93 or something. 92. 92 was yeah. Spirit House, right? Right, Spirit House was the first one that came out in 92, and uh, 2016, Jumpers. The number mm-hmm. 16th came out. And Chris, you've been in Bangkok since um, um, a bit before that, actually. I think the mid-80s. I, I've been here since Joseph Conrad stayed at the Oriental. Ah, but did he actually stay there? He did, actually, didn't he? He, he did, but it, it, but it was a guest house then. Right. It wasn't the Oriental that you would think of today. Somerset Mourn dance there in the ballroom. They, still, they, have, they have the Somerset Mourn suite there. Do they have a Conrad? Uh, they have well. a Conrad's right. suite. They have a Somerset Mom suite. Uh, they have a Gorvai Vidal suite. Wow. And okay. it's like $1,000 a night. So Mandarin Orienti- Oriental Hotel, if you're listening, we are, we are looking for sponsors. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, 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 and suites. And suites. Because <laughs> we're in, uh, what, what building are we in? Uh, at, RSU Tower. RSU right. Tower today. Yes. Our, our normal yeah. venue has uh, slipped out from beneath us. Yeah, so, so I think we've just got to give a quick nod to this place, where, where we are today. It's very formal. We're in an office kind of meeting room environment, which is not what we're used to on this podcast. We're used to a kind of... Um, quaint little room above a above a bar yep. uh, which is which is really nice and full of character and uh, everybody loves going there uh, it's, it's a real co- sort of cool place to do a podcast mm-hmm. and, and this is well, a little bit sanitary would we say gents very clean yes i would say it's a little bit like a deep programming chamber for scientologists yeah i mean that kind of thing that you can't see actually but that's kind of hypnotic in a way i feel like i'm Maybe he's subject to some kind of LK, MK Ultra uh, programming. It's, it's not very Bangkok for us old timers, anyway. <laughs> John, did you did you sign the release form on your way in? <laughs> <laughs> I did actually have to sign my name for the for the bill. Actually, but <laughs> I don't know. I didn't check the small print, guys. Actually, so the e meters get wheeled in in a bit. I think about halfway through. <laughs> and Are they those things that you have to? You have to hold in your hand, and they well, take. Well, they're like. I mean, Scientology. I mean, the, the idea is that you become clear, right? Once you're answered, going uh, clear. You're, right, you're yeah. asked a number of questions, and the idea is that if the question doesn't uh, invoke a reaction, uh, then you're clear on that particular subject. Right. So what yeah. it is, it's like a lie detector machine, an e-meter machine, uh, and, also, so, and also, and <laughs> also, a, a way of getting your deepest secrets out of you, right? And yeah, then exactly. holding, holding them held back. on record. It's it a bit like blackmailed thereafter. Respect. 
Manchester for the rest of your life. That's right, yeah. John. Yeah, but that's you, right. But you do get uh, free tickets to Tom Cruise films. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Shit. Did you see Tom Cruise at that Scientology fest where he had that big kind of medal on? He was like saluting LR, LRH, you know, here's to LRH. It was just so... he, he's changed, though, hasn't he? He's cooled off on Scientology. Isn't well, it? I'm not surprised after the, all the, the scandals. The, the, yeah. Yeah, that's but right. Jesus Christ! That I mean, I, I'm that's not offending anyone box. here. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Did I say? I oh, know that's that's the Lord's name. Name. Oh, thing. okay. That's, okay. That, that's only five baht then okay. instead of ten. But um, I must just say, guys, um, I feel really lucky because in doing this podcast, I get to meet some really cool people. And whenever else in my life would I get to sort of sit next to two? No, no, three. Just really cool, great novelist and, you know, pioneer... Well, you said not pioneers, James, buccaneers, right? Of Just the, wandered down the soy cowboy. Of the sea. Yeah, yeah. But, but I wouldn't get you for an hour <laughs> and sober, right? <laughs> <laughs> I might get some dribbling... Uh, <laughs> some, uh, yeah, some late hours dribbling into uh, your sort of vodka glass or something. Well, there, might, there might be a background noise. That way. Sadly, yeah. this is as coherent as you'll ever get us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, so this is great. And uh, um, Christopher, I know you... Did you recently do the Bangkok podcast? Yes, I did that. Yeah, yeah, I listened. It was really great. But, but that leads us on to something, actually, that, that we're going to talk about. How, how do we think, like, media is changing in the way people are consuming media? Because I'm a podcast junkie, obviously, and I do one. But do, are you guys into podcasts now? Do you, do you listen to them? Not as much as I used to. I used to be crazy for podcasts, but now... To be honest, man, to be lazy, there's so much on YouTube. You can get yes. access to just about anything you want now. Yes. And it's, it's just amazing, and it takes up a huge amount of time. I went from the First World War to uh, Mike Tyson yesterday, thoroughly investigated both, and it took the whole day. <laughs> What a what a crazy link! First World War to Mike Tyson. Yeah, you and, see, and, and that was all sort of the suggested videos on the right hand side. They lead you down some rabbit holes, don't they? That's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I think that's uh, part of what's happened. Is our attention gets split into these little baby universes of knowledge? You know, suddenly we go with the very best intention just to check out the latest research on cholesterol, and before we know it. We're somewhere in sub-Sahara Africa, yeah. near an oasis where people don't have enough water to drink. And we think, my God. How did I get here? How did I get here? And now I'm going to take the next link, and I'm looking at the malaria statistics of Bulgaria. I didn't even know Bulgaria had malaria, but apparently they do. And so you can spend the whole day, and at the end of the day, you do a summary of what you learned. And it's basically a blank. It's a lot of little bits and pieces. You have a Frankenstein monster of an encyclopedia that makes no fucking sense. Well, you think I don't need to remember that? I can just watch it again when I need to know more. You know? Information and knowledge. Yeah. What, what is what is the difference between information and knowledge? And is uh, uh, is the uh, malaria uh, statistics in you know are, are those statistics in Bulgaria? Is that information or is that knowledge? Knowledge is really what you do when you manipulate information to draw inferences from it. What you're looking at is the, 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 the data, the big data is raw. So you don't really know what the implications are. And what you want to do is to say, look, here are some interesting correlations. The people who have flu symptoms seem to have recently been on the Internet Googling Detroit. We don't know why, but there's a correlation between mm. Googling Detroit and flu statistics in Birmingham, England. That's How right. did that ever happen? Knowledge traditionally is, is, is understanding. In other words, it's experience. The old English word understanding means you've got underneath the subject and it's become part of your experience. It's a completely different thing from collecting data. And if that's used, it's, it's wisdom, right? Yeah. I mean, that's information, knowledge, and, and, yeah. wisdom. and wisdom. You're quite right. And wisdom is, is the traditional name for religious experience. The, the problem with w wisdom is it's way down the road of knowledge, and most people get run over by the bus before they get anywhere near <laughs> the end wise. of that road. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just you see the splatter marks all around you. That's right. That's interesting. And I, in terms of this, uh, is it knowledge or is it information? I used to work with a guy that, that 
that really swore to me that it wasn't uh, what you know. It was knowing where to find the information. So it, he, he said, you can have everything in your head, you know, but it's really knowing. And I'm talking about my job now. I'm, I'm an architect. So it's like building standards and all that mm. kind of thing and construction standards. And he said, you know, you don't have to have it all in your head. You just need to know where to find it. So I, I guess disagree. That's a, I disagree. I mean, I've had these arguments with people where, yeah. they, where they'd be on their computer Googling it <laughs> whilst, whilst I'm using my knowledge, you know. No, and yeah, I agree with you, actually, James. I, yeah. I, think, I think the, the, um, the process of um, digesting information in a... Uh, and it depends what media form you digest that information. I do think that if you're digesting that information through um, literature or through a book, it has a much better chance of becoming knowledge as opposed to a TV show or even a, even a podcast. Um, and all this information which I do digest, digest, especially online now, and I do it all the time, um, and I often go to sleep um, listening to a YouTube program or a mm. podcast on a, on a subject I'm particularly interested in thinking it'd be like the old linguaphone method, you know, where you'd learn in your sleep. Yeah. And I would have these bizarre dreams where the subject's there, uh, but it's being kind of taken apart and it's being erased by my mind. I, I think that, um, you know, um, when you're sleeping, there's like this neural uh, cleansing that goes on where you remove bits of information that you don't need. Definitely, yeah. So I think oh, when you have those bizarre dreams about mosquito counts in Bulgaria and stuff like that, it's your brain's way of saying, hang on, we don't actually need this. You know, it's not, well, you're, you're, not gonna, it. you're not going to use it for anything. So it's, the knowledge is the application. A wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's using knowledge you've learned. Um, and then it becomes... Uh, There's a lot of things that we no longer need that we used to need. Nobody needs to learn to spell anymore because it's all there on mm, the computer. That's true. And that's nobody, really true. nobody does. And um, you can't justify Anglo-Saxon spelling at all. So it's, it's, if you're an English speaker, it's a good thing because you've got the, uh, you've got the spelling there at your fingertips. But understanding something which is, uh, has some depth to it, mm. it doesn't help you understand... How, Hamlet or King Lear or anything like that. So there's a there's a the divide in many ways has become much clearer and much more specific between information and knowledge. I would say. Yeah, I yeah, I did this uh, my most recent book, Rooms. So I'm looking at the kind of the long trajectory of how we evolved knowledge and how we used it. And I think you know, like hunter gatherers. They didn't stop and say, there's a berry. I better Google to see if that is edible or not. Uh, there, there is a track. I don't know what that is. I better take a photograph of it. In other words, we've become cognitively lazy. We, at the same time, we think, okay, we have supplemented our knowledge base because we can find out things that would be hard to find out otherwise. But in some ways, that's a slippery slope. Because we, the more cognitively lazy you become, the more reliant you are on a knowledge base that is not residing in your experience, but residing in the experience of others, and you're relying on that experience as a surrogate. And we never did that as a species. We relied, and we had to rely, to be self-sufficient on our knowledge. And if we were mistaken, we paid a high price. And that knowledge base is now very easily manipulated, as we've, we've seen in the wow, uh, yeah. American elections. If you want to change reality, you just, uh, you know, you, you reprogram. Yeah, you, you reprogram your um, computer and uh, send it out. That's it. That, that's interesting. That, that, that to me is really interesting that, you know, the whole kind, we're, we're storing everything in the cloud now, aren't we? And if, if, if the power went out even just for a few few weeks or a few days there'd be there'd be turmoil wouldn't there just it would either be a miracle or a disaster it'd be yeah. like the burning of the books <laughs> in You're alexandria right, yeah we'd either thrive we'd, we'd either thrive or capitulate but we yeah we'd probably feel some kind of release wouldn't we but and it's when all the infrastructure as it is now that's right uh, going back to your room, atms uh, and yeah, how would you pay for rooms, anything i mean when, when the hospitals <laughs> exactly. are running from from the cloud when the smart fridges and the cars are running from the cloud you yeah. know we've only got so much time before uh, we, we can we can escape this uh, potential reality. But I, I do feel like we're in sorry, sorry. But I do feel like we're in a great place it, in Thailand. And I know I've spoken about it on this podcast before. But up up country, 
where my wife's mum, uh, where where my wife's mum lives, they they still use uh, ox in the field. That's true. Actually. They still they still barter. They still have a bartering economy. Like um, somebody will bring some mangoes round to my mother in law's house, and she'll give them some bananas. And so it's still. I I think if if the power did go out, I think America would be excuse my language fucked. Um, but I think here we'd just I'd just go up country for a couple of weeks. And East Sand would be thriving. Yeah. They, they'd have the food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they have it, uh, the, the bullocks. They'd have everything. Exactly. I think we're in a good spot here for the, the apocalypse. They're they're more anti fragile to to use a current term. Definitely. Is our fragility? We live in a city, Bangkok, of about twelve million people. Cut the power here. Wait six weeks and see how many people are left. It, oh, yeah. People could not survive. If you can't, Once the loot it, is done. It, there's no air con, there's no refrigeration, uh, the transportation system stalls, you can't get food in, you can't get water, uh, you're going to have epidemics, you, have you can't to flush at- the toilets. And so as a result, <laughs> you suddenly find a whole city that would collapse. Mm. The people who had lived the most untouched lifestyles up in the top floor of the uh, penthouse suite and who rely on getting down each day in the lift to their driver in the limousine and occasionally travel by SkyTrain if they feel like really, you know, roughing it with the locals. <laughs> These are the guys most vulnerable. And this is, this is what... But, I mean, you talk about vulnerability and panic. You only have to look at the smog today in the last few days. I, I tried to buy an air purifier. They're sold out all over the city. You cannot buy an air purifier mm. anywhere. This is panic. It's cheaper to die, isn't it? And, <laughs> and the masks as well. It's difficult. You, you know those old cartoons of the guy with the trench coat? You want to buy a watch? Now it's, oh, yeah. now it's a, now it's a <laughs> <You> mask. <laughs> You, you want a mask? You want to breathe? Uh, I'll make you a bargain on this. And you come back to my place and I've got air purifiers. Someone needs to do a meme on that and stick it on Facebook. That's a good one, Chris. Hey, mister, you fancy you living? <laughs> yeah. But someone said to me, and you guys know the history of Bangkok better than me, that actually the smog's pretty much like this every year. It's just more I disagree. I, I've never year. known it that's bad. I've been, really? I've, that... I've been here 18 years and okay. it, there's always been smog, but nothing like this. I mean, you, okay. you get a headache, you get a sore throat. I'm pretty resilient. I was brought up in the, in the pea supers in London, but I've never, yeah. never experienced anything like this. All oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, it was bad here in uh, the 90s until they basically banned leaded fuel. Mm-hmm. That was a huge, significant improvement to the air quality. But the result is that with many more cars in the city, a lot more construction, yeah. uh, coal-fired generator plants, uh, seasonal burning, all of that adds to the fine, small particles that you can't see. We look at a haze and we go, whoa, wow, that's mm. that's dangerous. When it's... Not hazy, it doesn't mean it's not, yeah, is that it's true. safe. It's PM 2.5s or whatever. It's, right? it's, right. it, it's that, that is the yeah. particle micro measurement. It is like <sighs> one third of the diameter of a human hair. And when that gets into your lungs, you can have some very serious problems. But the big problem is the diesel, though, isn't it? I mean, they had exactly the same thing in Paris, and they just banned diesel, and they've, they've got a sort of a vendetta against diesel. Yeah. And it has helped a bit in Paris. So I guess, you know... That's crazy. For years, we were all urged to, to buy diesel, That's weren't right. we? And yeah. then suddenly we're all getting... Ta- I just bought a petrol car, actually. But anyway, yeah. but yeah, I wonder if that would help over time, the banning of diesel. I mean... I don't know. They're using alternate number plates in Paris, and that seemed to, to help quite a bit. Ultimately, you know, the, it's the private car and the truck that's the, 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 the villains of the piece. Well, and, and, and it's, the, the thing is, is, it's the larger economic system that relies on cheap transportation to deliver services and goods. Yeah. Diesel is cheap, and it's not... Diesel is just not one thing. There is an international standard for what goes in diesel. The Thai standard is below international. So it is a dirtier diesel that's being burnt at the moment, and that's causing the problem. And since diesel has been subsidized, about 38% of the new vehicles that are coming in are diesel. And then you've got all of the old buses uh, in Bangkok, and you, you look at these black clouds that they're sending into the atmosphere, and then you think, I wonder if 
anyone's aware of what's causing some of this problem? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're the only buses that have the windows open as well, because then they're yeah. free too. Do, well, what's it actually doing? I mean, I, I go running every day at Benja Kitty Park around the thing, and someone said to me, you, 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 you basically you, you, may as well not go. You're killing yourself. Because you're yeah. running straight into that pollution, like in your. You take it, it d- me, deeper into your lungs. It makes me feel good, though. It's, <laughs> I mean, endorphins, it, but it's like jogging in a coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that I do every day that gives me some semblance of of psychological well being. Stop doing that. Is, yeah, yeah, I've got it's to bad stop, for you. stop doing that now. It's bad for me. Holy shit! I'll, I'll, if I didn't have a runner, I'll tell you what. There's Mickey before a run and Mickey after a run. The one before a run is. Uh, not get, get a get a Xiaomi treadmill with a Xiaomi um, air purifier um, yeah. in, the, in the apartment. And, Good you know, one, yeah. You can rest yeah. assured knowing you're making the Chinese because rich we, whilst you're. We've started shutting our windows at night, but the, it's just as bad inside, isn't it? If you don't have an air purifier, but yeah, okay, I might, I might try that. <laughs> Xiaomi is that a good brand? Is it, James? <laughs> Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. It, it comes uh, with a uh, a Chinese social ranking credit system oh, attached. Yeah, you get you get like a, a plus twenty score um, the moment right. you purchase it. And uh, yeah, if you're listening, Xiaomi, we are looking for sponsorship. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I'll see what you do here, James. I like it. Yeah. So yeah, the Chinese. Yeah, I mean they, that's crazy. So if you buy a Xiaomi, you can get like some sort of business class tickets or something or get a quicker train or something to you can uh, get your children into basic schooling right okay yeah. <laughs> so uh, you guys james i know you've been in bangkok 18 years uh christopher how long have you been in bangkok i came in 1988 to live holy crap so that's 31 years uh, something like that yeah and a new uh, a- a- 18 years i mean holy yeah. shit right okay so yeah, okay. So I, I'm six years. So I'm I'm a relative Bangkok baby. Uh, so how how's it changed over the years? I mean, you know, from uh, I think we sort of said earlier, from sweatshops to uh, to high rises, and from swamps to shopping, shopping malls. I, I, I would say money. The money that's poured into the real estate yeah. in downtown uh, Bangkok is just amazing. It was a yes. relatively primitive, old style Asian city when I came 18 years ago. But now, especially with the Helix buildings and, and, and stuff like that, the money that must be poured into real estate is just amazing. And nobody seems to mm. explain where it's coming from. One rumor was that Goldman Sachs was laundering money from Mexico and pouring it into uh, to the real estate here. Another is that the, the Chinese... Um, community have enormous faith on where the, where the place is going. I've I, heard that. I think both of those things are probably true. But if you walk through the Helix, I do not see people buying those incredibly expensive goods, but the shops are open all the time. Where's the Helix? Uh, uh, Prom Pong Station. It's opposite the Emporium at Prom Pong. Okay. Right. It suddenly so grew while I was away. M-Quartier. Right? That's it. That's the place. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the one, the the um, the one, the embassy shopping mall as well, uh, which Chitlom. is down near Chitlom, yeah. where it's all just Prada and well, I, just I never see anybody in there. They? They're not retail units; they're uh, showrooms. Yeah. So it's just to show you know what you can aspire to. Um, You've got to spare hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You can buy a lovely loudspeaker in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, what the kids—the kids who have that amount of money. I mean, normally, I mean, it's children that are kind of fooled into this. Kind the, of Lamb- trap. the Lamborghini kids. The Lamborghini yeah, kids. There's always I mean, a Lamborghini outside, isn't there? Parked yeah. outside. But these, yeah. these, um, the these shopping malls are like the catalogue. Do you remember the catalogue you used to get at home, and then you'd see what you wanted, and you'd go to the actual mm. shop and buy it. I mean, these kids they go to Europe yeah. and they go and buy Prada or whatever, but they can just yeah. have a little look in the stores and get right. an idea. Okay. Yeah, these yeah are, that makes sense. These are nice expensive. stores. They're very pleasant to walk through, and especially with yeah. the circular ramp in the um, in the Helix building, yeah. and some fantastic restaurants. A huge selections of restaurants at the top. But if you look yeah. at the retail shops underneath, like the the expensive music outlets, never anybody even inside looking. Mm. Amazing. All oh, those places that sells like boutiques or turntables and yeah, that's know, speakers right. yeah. and stuff. With, yeah, there's with, nobody with, ever. There's only like <laughs> three items for sale in the yeah, entire that's, shop. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but you can have your initials on it. <laughs> you know, I came in 1988. I think yeah, the you know Bangkok uh, was a very different kind of place. The mm. world was a different. 
place. Sure. We have to take into account the interconnectedness that we have now. In 1988, you had to have a, a special license from the government to have a, a, a fax machine. Uh, everyone had dial phones. It was unbelievably expensive to phone uh, overseas. If you wanted to know what was going on in the world, every Friday or Saturday morning at the Foreign Correspondence Club, there would be a reel of the American news that people would come and see what had happened the previous week. In other words, we lived in a far more isolated Bangkok. It's hard to imagine how fundamentally social media and the Internet has leveled things in the world. And there, and we got all these high rises here, but it's not just Bangkok. It's, you, you look at Shanghai, you look at Hong Kong. I remember going to Hong Kong in 1983 for the first time and seeing the city then. And you look at Hong Kong now, it's unrecognizable. It's unrecognizable. From, from 1983, just like this place is. And Shanghai, the same thing. So it's not just Bangkok that has Grown up, I was almost going to say flowered, but I'm not certain if this is if this is the appropriate uh, metaphor in this situation. It's it's more like mushrooms that have come up. Uh, Thailand, Thailand was a fantastic country in those days. I didn't live here, but we used to come here from Bangkok, from uh, Hong Kong on our and I was working in Hong Kong, uh-huh. and what a relief! You got out of the plane in Bangkok. So relaxed, that sort of Thai Buddhist, easygoing attitude, and you and could get the go, smiles, you know, the smiles, yeah. and you you got the train. We used to get the train up to Chiang, uh, Chiang Mai, overnight train, first class, fantastic bunks, that, and you used to get out in this country town, where you could go and um, do a do a, a trip in the in the jungle on an elephant, sure. and you really felt that it was a real thing somehow. An adventure, was, yeah, uh, you know, you didn't feel that. A million people had done it before you. It was, just, I mean, obviously it wasn't new, but it was, um, it was seriously good fun. It was. And at the expat population, the foreigners who were living here, came from a different background. You didn't have digital nomads in 1988. No right. one would have known what you were talking about. You didn't have people who came here necessarily for a job. They were adventurers. They were layabouts. They were diplomats. They were journalists. Yeah. There were all kinds of... Uh, well, most of them were criminals, <laughs> but uh, th- 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 that aside, it wasn't like people were talking about their middle class office jobs. Exactly. They were talking about, oh, I've been in this war zone, I got shot at over this place here, I went up there yeah. and almost got eaten by crocodiles. And when I was in a war, this happened and, and this happened to my friend, etc. So you were in an environment which was rich with individual experience and stories about experience. Mm. That has changed because people now have outsourced their experience through social media. You want an experience? You don't want to get dirty and it might be dangerous. So watch it on YouTube. Well, that's that's a shame. Yeah. That's the shame of it. it. It was genuinely different. I mean, you could, you could do a trip. I did my first trip in the hills above Chiang Mai. And part of the trip was to stop off at an opium village. You know, you know they, that's what they did. They had these guys with submachine guns walking around this field because they were protecting it. But they didn't mind some foreigners coming in saying hello. You stayed overnight in a little hut, and we stayed with this wonderful, really beautiful old Thai couple. And, you know, just uh, about like seven, eight in the evening, he got out the opium pipe and the opium and passed it around. And I'd never, never touched the stuff before. I laid back and looked at this roof and thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Sounds there was a sense you could just totally get off grid back then as exactly well. Exactly what I'm saying. You would, <clears throat> you know, you'd say goodbye, you know, um, to your loved ones, to your family, to your mm. parents or whatever in the UK, and then you just disappear. You wouldn't speak to them Send for a postcard, six maybe. months or a year or something. Mm. And nowadays you see these guys who have gone missing for like 12 hours, and there's like <laughs> yeah. a, a missing persons That's campaign right. all over social media. It's like we, we spoke to him yesterday, but he hasn't sent us a message since. Yeah. Yeah. He's in a brothel. Just let the kid have, you know, just give him a weekend. You well, know, or if, you're, if your Apple Watch broadcasts fall and then we've got, you've, you've alerted no. the whole of the security yeah. forces. And, and, and you used to be able to go through immigration, I'd imagine, 
in Thailand, and there was no real record. There'd just be a bunch of paper in an office. And That's you, right. You know, no one would really know where you were. Mm. And there's a certain glamour to that. You I could think, always bribe lost. someone if you got into trouble anyway. You know, yeah, exactly. one of the things I was doing with the Calvino books is really chronicling over about a 25-year period these kind of changes. Because when they're happening, they happen gradually. It's not like this stuff just mm-hmm. happened in the last six months. It's happened over a period of time. And at some point, you start to notice this is a serious change of direction. We've shifted emphasis. The people who are here now are different in terms of their world view mm-hmm. than the people who were here before. And so what you start to understand is that shift, that transition, we've lived through it. We're now on the other side of something that we're trying to comprehend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. What's dying out now? We, we were speaking about this uh, briefly before at lunch, but there used to be two types of, uh, like, tra- we used to call them travelers, but uh, tourists, I guess you would call You'd have, like, the, the local guys working here, like, involved in the, the bargel industry and the kind of, who, who you'd label as, like, sex pats. And they, they, they would <laughs> yeah. be, like, the, the backpacker kind of uh, yeah. traveler. And... Now there's just such a, you know, enormous rainbow of different types of people here. You've got people, you've got like fashion models, you've got TV guys, mm. photographers, uh, lots of school teachers and different types of school teachers, international and so forth. Mm. Um, a lot of writers. That, writers, bloggers, <laughs> uh, podcasters. Ta- time know, out guides bloggers. to Bangkok, my God. And you have yeah. mass tourism. That's 30 right. years ago, there was not mass tourism. Right. I yeah. mean, to come here, you had to make an effort. Yeah. And there, there were not people to hold your hands. You were not hanging out in internet cafes, talking to your friends back home and talking to your mom on Skype. You, when you came here, you were here. And you were Moxie. cut off uh, from the outside world for all practical purposes. And that was part of the fun. I mean, that was sort of why you did it in a way. Exactly. Especially if you worked in Hong Kong, the last thing you wanted was to be connected. You wanted to, to relax you had your, in a completely different atmosphere. Yeah, you had your Lonely Planet and your little phrase book. I yeah. came first in 2001 backpacking. Cassettes and I had as well. I had phrase cassettes book. and a Sony Walkman. Did you? Know? <laughs> yeah, Cop- I, I did too. Cap. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I still haven't got it. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's just so easy. There's devices on your phone now where you just say what you want to say and hand well, it to the them. maps as well. I mean, the, good, the fun thing about traveling and going somewhere new is kind of getting a bit lost yeah. and then trying to figure out a city, you know, yes. and how to navigate your way around the city. I mean, it's no fun if you've got Google Maps. Yeah. But see, this is, I think, part of the, the new psychology is there is a huge fear of getting lost we used to get lost, and by being lost, you learnt something fundamental you about yourself oh, and uh, how you can survive, how you adapt. And sometimes getting lost is a good thing. You discover things you would never have found. Now everyone is on a GPS, and, and the great fear is, my God, my GPS isn't working. Yeah. I could get lost. Yeah, people have nervous breakdowns. They're just thinking about stuff yeah. like that. That's how scientific discoveries are made, by you know scientists getting lost and going off track and thinking yes. ways they shouldn't... It's how novels are written. It's how novels are written. That's it's, really true, actually, that no, nobody takes like risks anymore, do they? And like, just goes off the beaten track and says, okay, what will be, what will be, and wherever we end up, we end up, let's just go in that direction. It, there's none of that now, really. Well, what happens is you find the story. They discovered the body. It was half eaten by wolves. <laughs> yeah. This is what happens when you get lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah when you Beware. go off the beaten track. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's all those horror stories, isn't there? Well, there was that lady down in Koh Tao, I mean, in, in Deaf Island, if we can call that call it that here. Oh, those half feet. She got oh. eaten by monitor lizard, or by monitor lizard, and these guys, at these, they were sitting on the beach, and they saw this, this lizard crawling up into the jungle and coming back down, you know, with, with body parts in its jaws or whatever, and they, <laughs> they walked up there, and they found this woman who had apparently committed suicide and then uh, well, well, left herself in the forest to be eaten by the lizards. Oh, I thought you were going to say she'd get she offered herself lost. to the lizards. She, <laughs> she didn't speak to her parents for 24 hours. Well, you That's can get happens. lost, but you have to be <laughs> careful <laughs> who <laughs> finds you. If she'd had yeah. an iPhone. <laughs> now, yeah, if she'd been online, it was or she never... She could at least have taken pictures. 
They're pretty dangerous. Uh, you know, what? what's... It, I'm sorry, I'm going to go right off track here, but you know you get the Komodo dragons. Mm. What's the difference between those and the big monitor lizards we size. get here? No, so no, they're the same no, thing. Different species, no, they're not, they're not the same. The, 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 mono, the monitors are not carnivorous normally. It's the Komodos right. are. Um, they, but they can they bite They carry them, don't they, if you're dead? No. Oh, oh, you're, you're, the monitoring. The, the, you, the, yeah. The, uh, yeah, but um, anyway, either lizard, but especially Komodo, they, what kills you, even if it's just a small bite, is the, the poison. Yeah, the um, bacteria. The bacteria yeah. apparently is amazing that they've got there. But apparently, it's all a big show. There's one thing I didn't do when I was in Hong Kong, but I knew, had friends who did it. You go and they, found, they find an animal for the Komodo lizard to kill, and everybody stands around and takes pictures. It's just a, a big yeah. show. There was, was a great, there was a great video online of a monitor lizard devouring a monkey, and it's just got the whole monkey in its mouth, and you can see the back legs and the tail of the monkey, so it's, and it just... Now, that's, it. that's the kind of knowledge I need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds see? like a political commercial. <laughs> that's the difference between knowledge and, and, and information. <laughs> Gone full circle. Brilliant. <laughs> so where next? Toilets, guys. <laughs> <laughs> from from uh, monitor lizards to toilets. I don't know. This is great. We were talking about Terminal Twenty One and the um, this is a shopping mall just down the road here. Yeah, opposite my. I can see it from my room. You're on soy fourteen, right? Yeah, You're right next to where Hemingways used to be. I live two doors from there. Oh, well, I I, th- I think you have to explain. Terminal Twenty One is the 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 basic architectural format is, if you can imagine, a shopping mall based on an airport terminal. Mm. But it's not exactly a terminal (laughs) because each floor is a special country or region of the world, which is also an airport terminal. I know that's confusing, but no one seems to really care. I've never understood that place. Why call it Terminal 21 anyway? And it's all about clothes. It's just a massive clothes outlet. It wasn't, there's not much more there. Yeah, it's, it's very Salt Sinisan, isn't it? Yeah. Terminal 21 is something you expect in Siberia where you go without clothes in a very hard winter situation <laughs> because you're politically incorrect. Yeah. So be careful, John. And you yeah. get <laughs> some sort of prison camp. People go there to commit suicide as well, don't they? Or get killed by yeah. cops. Yeah. Had it all. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. mistook it for the airport. At Terminal 21. <laughs> what, which floor is that on? The suicide floor. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if, if, well, if, if guess, you've ever been shopping there, you would understand. I guess because you could get that huge ele- elevator yeah. that goes all the way. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. That's, it goes all the way up the top. It's like a roller coaster. So ride, you've got plenty yeah. of opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have, but actually, Terminal Twenty One, bloody good food in the food court. I'll tell you that because we eat there all the time. So there you go, travellers, uh, backpackers, if you're listening. Thirty baht, you can go up to Terminal Twenty One, sixth floor or whatever, and uh, you can get a good meal for thirty baht. And it is an actual retail um, place as well. It's not a showroom. They're yeah. all kind of small stores, but particularly so if you want to sponsor London us, uh, <laughs> yeah. So if you're listening, <laughs> Terminal Twenty One. Uh, See, the problem with Terminal Twenty One and the rest of this is that. The, the great thing when we came here years ago is life was on the street. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The street right. life is being killed because the food court now is the same price as street food. Yeah. And so people are not eating on the street. They're not that whole community of people gathering of all different backgrounds eating on the street was part of the wonder yeah. of living street. in this they place. They're yeah. killing the atmosphere mm. like in Kaushan Road, but... I mean, you used to be able to walk up and down uh, Sukhumvit, and uh, especially on the odd number side, and you could buy just about anything you ever needed, whether it was a, it was a knife, a dagger, uh, some yeah. uh, uh, samurai what? sword, a samurai sword, Viag- a Viagra, uh, <laughs> <laughs> condoms, but when, when pornography, did that ha- paperweights. <laughs> <laughs> when did that happen? They, they literally just cleared everyone off the street, didn't they, at one point? And then they slowly kind of let people, some people come back, right? That was right. about it, 10 years ago, wasn't it? Was relatively cool. recently. They must yeah. have killed the police income. I used to watch them walk up and down, collecting money from yeah. them to, to allow them to remain where they were. So there must have been some substitute for that. And they're stopping cars now. What they're doing is they're stopping uh, taxis uh, with uh, foreigners inside. 
um, normally about one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Coming uh, back from normally like the Seelom area uh, yeah. um, down a sock road, there's a regular um, roadblock there, and a, a number of friends have been stopped and intimidated recently. So I think that, really? that's, that's really? how they're wow. that's how they're making up the shortfall. They must be making it. But they, how how are they intimidated? Well, you mean like saying uh, testing, gonna... uh, urine tests, oh, um, shit. planting. Uh, oh no! Planting man. things oh, in the car and yeah. The only time that something like that happened to me, I was coming back from the airport. I was sitting in the front passenger seat in the taxi, didn't put the seatbelt on, got stopped by a police. Fantastic English, really charming, beautifully polite. What would you like? Would you like to give me five hundred baht now, or would you like to come to the station? It will take the rest of the day and will cost you two thousand baht at the end. I would have gone for the 500, I think, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Since that, he put it so politely. Yeah. Th- that's a crazy story. And, and that's worrying to hear, because I, I thought those days were kind of over in Bangkok. But, yeah, you hear, uh, well, you know, that's crazy that people are getting stopped and pl- things planted on them. And, I, was, the, I a, was once stopped at the expressway. I was with my wife. We're going to a uh, country place. And mm. uh, we had a duck in a cage in the back. It was a nice sized duck, As one and does. we got pulled over at the ex, uh, at the uh, duck tax, <laughs> at, at the toll booth by the cops, who looked in the back and saw the duck, and asked for my uh, driver's license. So I had to take off my seatbelt, and I showed him my driver's license. He says, "You're not wearing your sweet seatbelt," <laughs> and I said, "That's true, <laughs> but you asked for my driver's license. The car isn't moving, and I couldn't get the driver's license otherwise." He said, that's, that's a relatively persuasive argument. What about the duck? <laughs> the I, duck said, I said, the duck is my wife's idea. Ask her. And <laughs> so he, he did. He asked my wife, what about the duck? And she said, well, we have a pond. Now, at this point, he thinks anyone who has a pond may have connections. Yeah. So he waved us on through with the duck and <laughs> said, but just be careful with that duck. <laughs> may, I, may I ask you a question, Christopher? Yes. What were you doing with the duck? Yeah. He had a pond. We had, had a, a pond. pond. <laughs> and, and, and we why were, were you transporting it? Though? Well, because you just bought it it's a longer story because we had pythons around. And so the pythons were eating the ducks faster than we can replace them. So you had to take the duck out with you. Every so we, you we, we take almost <laughs> weekly a new duck. And this, oh, right. this was okay. optimistic beyond any kind of rational explanation. We no longer take ducks out there because the, the at some point you just have to admit you cannot defeat a python that is intent on eating your duck. I wouldn't try myself. No. I, th- I, thought you were, I thought you were taking it to Country Road for them to cook it for you, but okay. Was... I thought you were liberating it from the market. Like yeah. you a, no, we were. Duck and then bas- basically, yeah, it was no, subsidized right. food for the pythons. Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah, python pet food. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's amazing. But, um, so you guys were around when, like, I, I always hear it, but, like, parts of Sukhumvit were actually just rice paddies, right? Some, some of the parts that we that are really developed now were still basically well, rice paddies. My, my original apartment on Soy 27, there were, it was a, part of it was still a dirt road, and it would flood every rainy season, yeah. and it would flood up to just, just below the knee, and that's when the snakes would come out. <laughs> and that's when people would send their maids for resupply of essential items. And ducks. Such as uh, ducks. Uh, well, there, no one ever saw a duck in that water, as far as I know. At least I never saw one. But there were lots of rumors of uh, various snakes and other reptiles uh, in, in that area. Mm-hmm. Now, I just passed it. I was saying to John earlier today, and noticed two huge... Uh, new hotels that are going up at the mouth of that soy. Mm. It's totally unrecognizable to what it would have been 30 I, years ago. I don't know that they've actually fixed the floods yet, though, have they? I mean, the, the big floods were only about, what, five years ago? And you had to wade across some of the subsoys. 2010, yeah, yeah, it was a big flood. It, it, was, it mm. was amazing. I mean, you couldn't yeah. get swept away. And I had to do a, an interview for a book with an American uh, broadcaster, and I explained that there were photographs on the on the TV where a crocodile had been caught mm. walking or swimming along the, the main road of a, of a village. And he just couldn't believe it. A crocodile in a main road and the main street, you know. There are quite a few cobras 
in Bangkok. Every so often, really? you'll see a, a story where someone sits down on the loo without looking oh, yeah. first, and suddenly oh, yeah. there is a, the a cobra uh, they're doing a little ticklish uh, just, massage there. Every year that comes up. I don't yeah, know it does. Do you know what? And the fact that it's actually true <laughs> is, just blows my mind. And I've seen the pictures, but I just can't... It's it sounds like urban it. legend, but it's yeah. not urban legend. No. Uh, but if, you, if, if you're a boy and you get nipped... It's fantastic. The girls think you must be super virile. You know? <laughs> and he, huge balls. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to make sure he doesn't cut it off. But <laughs> if it's just a little nip, this one kid had it, and he was the, he was the oh, star of the show. Swinging his big balls around town. Like yeah. A, yeah, superhero powers. Yeah, that's right. Circumcised in Bangkok. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah. But that subterranean uh, like um, ecosystem, you've got obviously you've got the rats down there yeah. um, in the sewers, um, and the snakes eat the rats. And the, Is that right? And okay. the monitor lizards are down there because monitor lizards basically live um, from eating shit. Um, that's yeah. why it's such an offence to call someone a monitor lizard in Thailand. You know, oh, ahia, really? ahia. Um, it's, oh, okay. it's it's really offensive because uh, okay. there's two reasons I think. That one is they kind of live off eating shit. And the mm-hmm. other one is that they scare very easily. So if you quickly run up to a monitor lizard, oh, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. know why I'm fascinated with monitors today, but they will. I've um, seen a couple. They, they just run off quickly. Benji because, Kitty, yeah, because yeah. They, they eat shit and they scare quickly, which is like an, wow. an insult if you're uh, but, a yeah. human being as well. So how how do the cobras do, do the cobras literally from the sewers then crawl up? And just into. I the, don't think they come up that often, but I've heard a story of someone <laughs> walking down my soy where he was, he was coming home one night, late at night, and the cobra just reared up from the oh, manhole shit. drain, or, you know, the, 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 the break in the open sewers. It just yeah. came up, head level, um, staring at him like that, you know. So I would have th- thought I was on drugs or something if that happened. You'd be like, is this actually real? Yeah. <laughs> like, head level. Yeah, I mean, it happened so quickly, you'd wonder if it was like a, a yeah. ghost or something, you know, in Thailand. It's not only oh. cobras, though. It's pythons you hear quite a exactly, lot about. Exactly, yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty big guys, those pythons. See, we're rooms people. We live in these self-constructed shelters, mm. and we don't understand. We've invaded an ecology yeah. which was snakes and rats and monitor lizards and alligators yeah crocodiles, all kinds of things. We've invaded and occupied their territory, and we feel offended that they're still here. Mm. In fact, that's what Bangkok mm. was. It was just a swamp. It wasn't where anybody wanted to be. They wanted to be over the other side of the river. And before Tongari, that, they wanted no. to be in Ayutthaya. Yeah. No. This was very much a third choice. And not that long ago either. If, I mean, if we look that's at right. cities like London and, and, and Paris mm. and compare it to Bangkok. We're, we're the mould growing, growing on the bread, aren't we? Definitely. Yes. But it's kind of the capital of Southeast Asia in many ways as well, isn't it? You know, um, It's a desirable place to to, to, to live yeah. I think if you're Asian it's a good place to, to start a business uh, yeah. it's reasonably uh, low cost um, workforce in, in many here. ways it's replaced Hong Kong as where yeah. you can come and start a business and make money you try to do that in Hong Kong you'd be eaten alive these days you'd need yeah, a, you couldn't rent anywhere it's so expensive <laughs> yeah you couldn't rent a, a shoebox over there but here you hear people, a lot of people doing really quite well starting businesses Mm. Right, but is there a lot of red tape, and do you have to pay off some people? And is there a, is there a lot of sort of under the table deals that need to be done to get these things moving? Everybody or? says you have to pay protection if it's uh, if you're on the high street, you know, if it's retail on the right. high street. I don't know if that's true or not, but everybody seems to say so. If you mm. want to start a bar or something, you're going to have to pay protection. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for uh, most foreigners. The easiest uh, interface in, in in Thailand is in the nightlife area, yeah. so it's easy to 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 see what's going on. Well, it's not easy, but if you spend enough time, you get an idea of what's going on, mm-hmm. and you have to be careful to project that on the rest of the economy, because yeah. I know a lot of people who have done business here very successfully who never had to pay uh, any. Yeah, me too. Any money? Yeah, yeah. So it it it, it's here, but it tends to be isolated in certain sectors. Yeah, entertainment sector. um, Yeah, basically. I I think if you're a hotel business, you'd be fine. Any kind of office space business. Yeah, I was going to say a couple of friends I know have construction type project management businesses, and that you know they don't. But if you open a bar in Pattaya, well. 
different story. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, if you open a bar and patio, uh, by definition, you're not a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> and you're paying Russians. Yeah, just, just I, was st- <laughs> I, I, I saw the other day that um, you might know this has been sort of crime writers, but there's hell, there's Hell's Angels, isn't there, in Patia? I think. But do you, have you guys ever written about those guys or? had any dealings with them i'm really interested in motorbike gangs i think they're pretty cool so if you're listening hell's angels we are we are available for sponsorship yeah uh, i thought it was the harley the rich harley davidson boys who used to go on these long expeditions to china that was uh, yeah that was the the big motorbike scene of you know a decade right. or so ago right but okay. that's changed hasn't it? you've got these uh, australian hell's angels yeah you see stories in the paper about murders and drug deals and stuff don't you and you wonder how pervasive it, the it MCs, really is they call them don't they the, the MC, mot- yeah, motorcycle yeah. clubs yeah, um, yeah i just find that so cool man but <laughs> i mean that's I, romantic the so. only ones i have met i mean i met this one Dutch guy, and I won't uh, reveal his name here, but he was a Hells Angel um, kind of cooling off, as they say, cooling off in uh, in, 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 right. in the Far East. And his, um, his, his deal was he would um, find out where a drug deal was taking place uh, between um, the buyer and the seller, and these were like big, you know, million euros yeah. or so, and he would turn up with a bunch of heavies um, armed take the drugs and take the money, sell the drugs, uh, keep the money. It's a perfect crime because the drug dealers aren't going to report it to the police. Yeah. Um, so as long as you've got... And he'd, he'd do like one of those a year and spend the rest of the time in, down in Patea or in Bangkok. Shit. That's uh, right. So you I don't lo- think the, the clubs st- here are active. They're kind of cooling off. hear a lot of stuff like that. I was told the story just a few weeks ago in English... And a middle-aged heroin addict came over here, wanted to buy some heroin. So he chatted up, you know, like a six-foot-six Nigerian for some reason. And Nigerian says, "Sure, man, you sold him some stuff. He took it home." And of course, this Englishman was outraged because it wasn't the real thing at all. Went back to the Nigerian, just told him how angry and upset he was that it had been done, and this, you know, this wasn't fair. That wasn't the way you do things. So the Nigerian said, "Sorry, man," and gave him some more, and it was exactly the same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a dumb, dumb heroin addict. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you are, you know, in the business of, um, you know, trafficking drugs or whatever, you wouldn't. Not really make a deal with the first person you met. It took a bit yeah. it would not a smart move, no. <laughs> yeah, you've got to network a little bit before you... <laughs> but, you know, I, but, but you're right. As crime writers, uh, it's interesting, of course, to look a little deeper under the layers where yeah. the law doesn't... The, the sunshine doesn't shine. Yeah. You go and you find things that are going on. It's true in any society. You're going to have a class of people who are clever and who don't have the same moral uh, values as the rest of society. Mm. And by looking at them and examining those kinds of lives, you're able to say something about how the institutions respond to that. Mm. Because every culture has to deal with it, and they have to deal with it in their own way. Mm. And the Thais find ways, their own ways of dealing with it as well. Mm. So it's not like somehow the uh, illegal stuff that goes on here is somehow unique in the globe. It's just one big city everywhere yeah. in the world with a similar kind of problem and different kinds of solutions to those problems. That's mm. exactly right. It's the internationalization of crime, mostly pushed by drugs, which is the big crime story worldwide, I think. Again, you know, you look at the social media, you look at Internet, the, the ability to communicate means the ability to cooperate internationally has accelerated to an extent that most people don't realize what that means, the significance of that in terms of crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think people would be astonished to know that there are Nigerian diamond smugglers who make regular visits to Thailand, but apparently it's a big deal and it's very, very common. The, wow. the, the uh, Thai Chinese diamond cutters will buy their stuff straight from a Nigerian who smuggled the stuff in. And I guess that way they avoid duty, they, and the Nigerian probably stole it or got it for free. Or These anything. blood di- there'll be blood diamonds as well, won't they? Yes, oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so there's a, there's a sizable Nigerian community here. People don't know yeah, about it at all. I know all. some Nigerian guys, yeah, uh, from another and time. Nigeria is one of the, the, the richer African nations, isn't yeah. it? I think it's maybe if not the richest. 
Um, prob- so, yeah, so the I- probably, yeah. So the idea that... Um, maybe Egypt or Morocco or something like that. Yeah, South Africa maybe. Um, yeah, anyway. But anyway, yeah, there's... Um, <laughs> Let's move away from sort of uh, South African e- e- economy. Uh, I can't even say the word. Economics, that's it. <laughs> that's but, that's but not really is, my strong suit. Yeah, there is there is crime in, in, in Bangkok. And I think what's interesting with drugs as well is what's happening now. Um, you see the legalization of, of cannabis oh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the States, obviously, in Canada now, and soon for medical purposes in, 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 in Thailand too. And you look at some of the pharmaceutical drugs like Ritalin and these kind mm. of things they prescribe for ADHD, it's pretty much speed. Uh, it's it's, it's well. amphetamine. And you do mm. wonder if, if the governments are getting wise to the fact that they can't really fight it. So if they no, legalize they it and sell it... That, There's a that, famous that, pharmacy not far from Soy Cowboy where you could just go in and buy Ritalin any time for you know, a, 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 any amount that, that you liked. Wow. But what I'm curious about now is that they've made... Can, they've, they've, cannabis is no longer a pro- proscribed drug. It's no longer an illegal drug. But why aren't we seeing it for sale? You know? I mean, if you're caught with cannabis, presumably they can't prosecute you. I, I'm, I'm, a, medical card, I, I'm not certain if that's the case at mm. the moment. I mean, the, the, the part of the, the challenge of living here is that when you read the media, wherever it is, if it's print or online, is you have things that are aspirational. That, and the aspirational things appear to be absolutely done deals, and they're not. Mm. And until it's a done deal, it remains illegal. So... If you're caught with pot, you're going to have to pay the cost one way or another mm-hmm. uh, at this at this well, point. That's what I was, I was curious about because in order to clear the way to to legalize it, they yeah. had the first thing they had to do is decriminalize it. So I don't know what they're prosecuting people for now. I, I think I think you must. I, well, I don't think it's come into play yet, has it? Anyway, but I think when it does, you have to have a prescription, um, and it will be dealt to you through a doctor. And that'll be it. There won't be like shop, like cannabis shops, like there are in the U in the U.S. I just a lot think. of rich doctors. But, but I, th- I think what they've found out is, I mean, Colorado in the in the United oh, States is a good example. Yeah, yeah. They had a Republican governor who fought tooth and nail against legalization, and it went ahead over his head. And after a couple of years, there was so much money coming in. Yeah. They were building stuff faster. I mean, they, didn't mm. have, they had more money than they knew what to do with. Yeah. And he came out and he said, I was wrong. You had someone who is on the right, very conservative, with the kind of knee-jerk reaction, this is bad, this is dangerous, finding out it's not dangerous. Mm. It's absolutely lucrative, and you're building better schools, better clinics, parks, less that, roads, right. less crime. Mm. You have less criminal elements who are corrupting your police, your judges, your prosecutors. In other words, almost on every matrix, it has been a win in the Colorado situation. Well, that was how they sold it in Thailand. One of the big arguments was the amount of money that was going to pour into Thailand once they legalized right. it. But the idea that you can have it for medical use only is a bit of a joke. I mean, they, they started yeah. that in California, and suddenly everybody had these diseases that could only be cured by cannabis. <laughs> Headache, <yeah. laughs> yeah. I think they want to export it. I mean, that's, uh, that's the plan, isn't it? If they, yeah. if they could be the hub of cannabis oil exportation in in, in South, Southeast Asia. Well, they will be. Um, and they will be. I yeah. mean, it will be really good business. But um, domestically, um, is it um, is it uh, advantageous for um, people to be using um, cannabis on a daily basis if you look at the collective society? Um, Better than alcohol. I, I would agree that... Um, but in a collective society environment where um, everyone has to kind of toe the line... And the smoke, smoking cannabis makes people more individual, more uh, creative. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. The place was was um, was full of opium dens in in the old days, and that that was the way of life. I, I mm. think on a, I never. But opium uh, similar to alcohol. You see, I think I think a lot of a, a lot of the drug laws are dovetail into our use of human labor. 
it, you want to domesticate it, malleable, manipulated population yes. for a physical labor force. Yeah. If you go to an economy where labor is less a component, you're better off drugging them to keep them in a domesticated, highly urban center mm. where otherwise they start to get restless, kicking against the stalls, wanting to get out and cause trouble. Well, the That's drugs right. have been has been used by governments for a very long time. The British Empire was was based on uh, on on the sale of opium, and, uh, and before that, agricultural um, uh, revolution was you know um, controlled on the basis of the and the byproducts of, yeah, uh, of, the, of farming. The, the whole alcohol. Of, the whole of Hitler's Germany was on speed. Apparently, it was on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Didn't they create crystal meth? Yes, that, that's the right. The Nazis yeah. created yeah. a lot of drugs. So the manipulation of a whole populace by use of narcotics is not new at all. That's right, yeah. But it's a matter of which narcotic is best to control. Well, what, yeah, suits are tailor-made yeah. to, the, to what you want to do with the people, yeah. <laughs> that's right. It, it's, it's, it's about what kind of environment allows political control to be maximized and allow economic activity to be optimized mm -hmm. and they're constantly tweaking the dials on that in order to keep the system from flying apart mm. but yeah i think you uh, something you you said a, min, uh, a few minutes ago christopher it's like the, the they want to tether you uh the government wants to tether you to your sort of five sense reality and keep you in that sort of work sleep work sleep kind of rhythm and I think that that's why they pushed against like weed and, right. and psilocybin for so long. So you think outside the box when? Yeah, because you start you 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 don't want people to just kind of the light to go on and people to yeah. become woke as as they as they call it these days. You you want people to to toe the line and. That's why they know. went hysterical about LSD. I mean, they went absolutely yeah. crazy yeah. to suppress LSD. If you question the world view which is the consensus view that makes you a danger. Yeah, exactly. And as a writer, that's your mission, is yeah. to question that worldview mm. and to get people to reflect upon it. Mm. Yeah, right. and, what, and what does taking a hit of acid or a, or a few mushrooms do that really starts you questioning the worldview well, as well, you, you doesn't quest, it? You question your rea reality. Well, that, that's why uh, we had Mark Devlin on this podcast, who's a, who's a musical conspiracy guy, and, that, and that's why I, I didn't really agree with him that, you know, when he said the government was sort of uh, swamping the place with LSD, I thought that would be counterproductive. He was talking about MK Ultra and, uh, you know, but the CIA that, that, involvement. That, that's completely with... different. MK Ultra was, was, was for Vietnam. They were trying to produce zombie soldiers in Vietnam and they did a, a, a lot of work on it yeah. and destroyed a lot of mines but um, and in fact that's how uh, Ken Casey became a, an aficionado <sighs> of acid because he, volu he volunteered to be uh, to take this LSD and I think he even got paid for it and mm. wow you know you get paid for getting high yeah I think it's $20 or $30 a, a session yeah um, and, and that, st that literally wow. started the LSD revolution craze literally, literally thanks craze. thank you CIA yeah yeah, yeah. wow okay but, so, he, but Mark's argument was then the later the LSD became uh, more um, ingrained in American countercultural um, society as a result of um, people like um, Hubbard and Tim Leary working for the CIA and um, flooding um, you know, San Francisco and uh, um, the West Coast with LSD and then the same people working in tandem with the Tavistock Institute in London purposely flooding um, London with LSD yeah. so they could manipul manipulate the people uh, which seems like a reverse argument to I, me. I, yeah, I don't buy that at all. I, yeah, I, the, the absolute opposite happened and the, the Tavistock was dealing with the consequences of people taking LSD. Think of Huxley's Brave New World, Soma. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, in other words, it's, it's often been said you look at Huxley's vision and you look at Orwell's vision and Huxley's vision seems to be the one that is playing out Mm -hmm. Because the soma is the ultimate drug that creates that sense of well-being and happiness, even though you're living in squalor and everything around you isn't quite right, but you're mm -hmm. easier to control. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the easier you are to control, the less expensive you are to maintain as part of the domesticated population. That's right. So summer, okay. perhaps, isn't yeah. a drug at all. It's maybe it's a handheld device. It you know, maybe. I mean, that's, wow, that's yeah. the ultimate drug, isn't that's it? Now, cool. the, the, the mobile telephone, you can be living in any kind of shack or, you know, um, hovel and still be escaping to this world. And when uh, 3D and uh, immersive technology, um, interactive technology, um, comes um, to um, real fruition, which mm. will do quite soon, um, you could re- really be living any VR. kind of miserable yeah. existence, you but, know, but, but, but participating in but VR would you, porn. Would or you wanna, would you want to <laughs> die like that? I mean, uh, Huxley's great thing, when he was about to die, he had himself injected with a, had That's a, right. a drip yeah. of yeah, LSD and had right. people, really? oh, people sitting around him, his best friends, and they said it was the most beautiful death they'd ever seen in Leary their lives. Did the same thing, didn't and he? how yeah. could you stop old people and people who are dying? I mean, what moral right do you have to stop them from doing that? Exactly. And, and they say that you give, you give um, you know, uh, an, an old age pensioner uh, one hit of... Um, Morphine, of mus- yeah. uh, Sorry, mus- mushrooms. Okay. And they did studies, and they said after one hit of mushrooms, they were r- less afraid of dying. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, they, they were taking these basically terminal ill patients and, and giving them mushroom therapy, and uh, basically a hundred percent across the board. After one session on mushrooms, they were not afraid of dying anymore. Five sessions, they were horny as hell and done soy cabo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right, uh, Michael Pollan. Pollan, uh, who's oh, in America, and wrote this uh, incredible yeah. book on he's how to change Rogan. your mind. Yeah. And he, he had a lot of credibility because he went into the whole psychedelics from a very skeptical, yeah. conservative point of view, wanted to be safe, was afraid, believed all the stories that you'd want to jump out of windows and so forth. And he started to see the kind of propaganda that had been used as kind of a smokescreen over what those experiences actually were. And so that book is really a journey of discovery for someone like him. And that book probably has done a lot to open a public conversation about psychedelics and about how our worldviews have been manufactured. Just say no in the Reagan era and it's all that crap. Yeah, and 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 people now are resisting the manufactured template of a reality that they know is not serving their interest. That's right. When we're so flooded with opiates and, well, in the US especially, with all, you know, Vicodin and whatever it is and Oxycontin and all that crap and... You know, the, and the sort of holding back, you know, things that grow in the ground that nature's given us. And I think people are seen as a con. They, it's they because governments now. can't make money out of that, but they can make out of the manufactured article. Correct. I mean, uh, yeah. that's particularly so with the opiates. You ban opium and then you make everybody addicted to an opiate. How, how crazy is that? Mm. Mm. The government defines what resources can be exploited, by whom, and who gets to keep the profits from that? What, and what to deal with the waste? What's yeah. really scary, though, on the figures is that, that a lot of governments could not possibly have existed unless their people were addicted to a drug that they had to pay duty on. I mean, that's, that's true of the British Empire. That's crazy. Apparently it was true of uh, Hitler's Germany. Um, it just goes on and on. Now, it, it, and we talked about this a little bit at lunch. I mean, if you look historically... The two most essential factors of civilization over over time have been slavery mm-hmm. and drugs. And when we mm-hmm. think of slavery, we think of it kind of from an American point of view of blacks, but slavery is much more than a racial category. Mm-hmm. It is a category, an economic category of political systems and economic systems yeah. that elevate an elite yeah. and allow them to basically see the rest of us as domesticated resources to exploit what needs to be exploited. That's exactly right. And a fantastic example of that. If once you admit that alcohol is a drug, which it is, you see that whole thing operating in Russia. The Tsars allowed vodka in Russia. Um, They realized they could make a lot of money out of it, so they made vodka pretty cheap and pretty available. They realized that the the people were simply destroying themselves with vodka. They couldn't let it go on. Under Lenin, they banned 
vodka, or they reduced it to an absolute minimum. After about 10 years, they realized they were losing so much money that they legalized it again. At the present moment, vodka income, government income, in other words, tax on vodka, represents 45% of the government's income. Holy shit. <laughs> There's a vested interest in keeping those people completely dependent on alcohol. I think it's a very good point. I mean, you, you take alcohol and then you take cigarettes, yeah. another drug. Think of the casualties that arise each year from smoking. Yeah. The millions of people who die from that. Yeah. And People say, oh, well, that's just kind of grandfathered in. Why is it grandfathered in? Yeah. Why would the mass slaughter of millions of people be something that's grandfathered in? Why don't we revisit that? And, and indeed, one of the things I've noticed living in Bangkok all these years is how few people now you see smoking. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. 30 years ago, you, you know, most of... Uh, the ties that you would see, they were smoking. Social, they were smokers. It was a smoking culture. Socially unacceptable not to smoke. Yeah. Mm. And s- smoking and drinking, uh, you know, the white lightning, uh, home-brewed uh, stuff yeah. uh, make, makes people pretty happy and groggy at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> this has been great. Uh, what a fantastic... Uh, and, yeah, we've, we've gone for a, about an hour and 20 already. We can go on. Um, or we can take a break, or we can we can wrap up. I mean, I do I do want to really talk to you guys about what you've got coming up in terms of book releases and what you want to if you want to promote anything. Um, but and James, have you got any more topics you wanna you wanna cover? Um, there's a list of topics on a whiteboard in front of us in this kind of <laughs> office, office environment that we <coughs> we're working in today, and um. Yeah, the subject I've been interested in and researching recently is, is pirates, uh, particularly during the golden oh, age wow. of piracy, which was kind of from the uh, late 1600s to early or halfway through the 1700s. And, um, and the pirates kind of went in two directions. They went to uh, Port Royal down in uh, Jamaica, one side. And they, they seemed to stop in um, uh, Madagascar, um, where they uh, manipulated or they... They, they intercepted the um, East um, Indian trade coming back from uh, uh, the Far East there. Um, but what I want my pirate to do is travel... Um, yeah, okay. Um, she's got another appointment at four o'clock. Um, okay. Five more minutes, Hannity. It's only 25 Sorry, we'll cut this out. It's yeah, only she said, she said she's got an appointment at four. So we've got another 20 minutes, haven't we, really? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, keep going. So pirates, James. I was heading towards transgender pirates. <laughs> um, well, we can't miss that. Well, and, and a number of these pirates, or two particularly famous ones, were actually female, and they um, managed to jump on board down in uh, Portsmouth or wherever it was, right? Um, and live as men for a number of years before um, the rest of the crew realised um, they're actually women. And I really, I find this hard to believe, but apparently so they just like paint beards on and stuff. <laughs> it <laughs> seems like there's a bit of a gap in British sex education. <laughs> they, they kind of wore. <laughs> they loose, they loose suddenly became clothing. very popular. Huh? <laughs> That's great. And spoke like with a really deep voice. Well, they didn't speak much, and when they did, it was kind of down like that. So they controlled their own ship as well, or they, they were sort of part so of someone else's crew? Two of which, uh, but Mary Reed was one, and there was another lady, a pirate, um, who became captains. Yeah. Really? So they, yeah. And, but in China, you see, I wanted my main character to be to jump on ship from London um, and then travel down to China, mm. uh, where there was pirate activity. Um, that predates, obviously, the golden age of Western piracy. Oh, huge in um, China, yeah. And their number one pirate character was a female as well. That's right. Uh, mm. Who commanded a number of ships, not just one. She um, was terrific. And, and a known female? Or again, uh, hiding her sexual... No, she was known. She was known. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah she Borges wrote a fantastic story about her. Sorry, carry on. Um, and then that reminded me of something in one of your books, Christopher, where you quoted the um, the art of war a number of times, which was also by a female Chinese philosopher. Um, so, yeah, that was my idea, to take from from, uh, from west to east, to, to yeah. a young lad, um, like a 14, 15-year-old boy who lives in the minories in London, 
where they used to nail the bottles so the kids yeah. used to sleep in the ashes there. Um, he's um, wanted for a crime and instead of, you know, he managed to escape um, and jump on ship and travel um, to, uh, to... So to, these pirates, were, were they all... Was it all like um, individual sort of business or was it state-sponsored? Like well, was they it started off as privateers, didn't they? The majority of them. So they'd be working <coughs> for the state... In, right. in, in southern China, they, they, were, they ruled the seas. They ruled the whole of the South China Sea. You didn't, you didn't mm. get to trade there unless you paid off the, the pirates. But in the, in, the, um, in the Caribbean, the British, once again, were, were a source of the problems because they licensed people, uh, captains, to go and destroy or rob Spanish galleons called mm. privateers. So it, it was state-sponsored... Mm. A piracy, basically. Yeah. And then they, t- they made piracy illegal, um, I think, just on the turn of the century, so like late 1600s, 1690, in Jamaica. And now Jamaica, Port Royal, was a pirate colony of six or 7,000 people. Yeah. Um, so they, in, like overnight, from a decision made um, in London and then in Jamaica, this whole community had to, had to jump ship, as it were. And, you know, they were all suddenly, you know, uh, really? working um, on the other side of the law, whereas before they were yeah. working for but, Yeah, but the crown. Port Royal flourished as, as a consequence. Mm. <laughs> but they had a tsunami <laughs> as well, the didn't they? The whole... <laughs> The whole the whole town was destroyed by a, mm. a tidal wave. I think sometime in the late. What, what era 16, is this? I think the the wave hit in sixteen ninety two from memory. Captain Kidd was hung in seventeen o one, and he was active in Port Royal. So yeah, early eighteenth century, late. Uh, so so late when would, when did century. Columbus? Uh, America, that was 1490 something. And they say it? he was like an original pirate yeah. as well. Like he was. Yeah. Hey, Colum- Columbus. Yeah, yeah I, I think our whole idea of, of piracy is, you know, we're looking back and projecting our modern sensibilities and commerce on uh, a system of transfer of wealth, as, <laughs> as it were. Yeah. And, bas- and basically a lot of European uh, governments and monarchies were benefiting greatly from uh, this activity. I mean, mm. my only pirate story is, is years ago I was working with a screenwriter named S- uh, Sterling Silifon who won an, an Oscar for In the Heat of the Night. And we were doing a, a piece about piracy in the Straits of Malacca. And I remember sitting at the typewriter and we're going, he says, and now we're going to put in a hurricane. And I said, Sterling, a hurricane? I don't think there are hurricanes in the Strait of Malacca. And besides... It doesn't fit the story. Why would you want to put it there? He says, because we get a percentage of the budget, and it's very expensive for Hollywood to do hurricanes. And so I figured that that's worth about $50,000 to put a hurricane with the the pirates. And I said, Sterling, okay, hurricane. Let's type that in. That's piracy in itself. That's, that was exactly. that was that was the Russian doll piracy thing. Within each doll, there's another piracy yeah. kind of story. My, my piracy story is that I, I was invited by an American who owned the property, uh, an old Portuguese rum factory on Jamaica, and we went over there. And when we got there, I realized that he'd smuggled in a metal detector. And then I realized that every American on the island also had a metal detector and that everybody was surreptitiously, because the government would take the the gold if you found it, everybody was looking for buried treasure. We didn't find anything, but I I realized afterwards that the Spanish galleons would make a specific trip known to the, 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 uh, the privateers, the pirates. They would steal... The the um, I mean they would kill everybody on board and take the gold. Then they had to stow it somewhere, and so it is actually true that all over Jamaica there there's gold that's been so buried somewhere really? or, or other. Yeah, and wow. this this guy, this American, was absolutely certain where the gold was because he went to um, a British clairvoyant. In <laughs> in Soho, <laughs> and he showed him a map, and he put a cross on the map where the gold was going to be, and charged, I mean, like a hundred quid or something for the information. And of course, we never find the gold, but the Englishman said, "Well, you haven't done people enough." Fantastic story. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, we used to have uh, metal detectors in British Columbia, 
west coast of Canada, and you would see them. They were particularly popular on Wreck Beach, which was a nudist beach. So people would be <laughs> going along yeah. the beach with these with these uh, metal detectors, not looking where they're going because there's too much else to look for other than gold, tripping and falling uh, on the shoreline. <laughs> so that's if you, my metal detector story. If you, if you hung out at a bar or something at that time, immediately if you were in a group of people you didn't know, you started talking about metal detectors and like the best medical de- metal detectors and how much it costs. And so. yeah. A whole culture around it. Yeah. Now it's headphones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Headphones and mics. It is. It's headphones. <laughs> So, guys, um, I th- well, are we going to... Th- I think... I do want to just ask you guys, then. Have you, have, so, uh, Christopher, uh, you've got a new... Is, is a new book out now, or it's yeah, just about it's, to come out? it's out now. It's called Rooms yeah. on Human Domestication at Submission. Okay, and and cool. the, basic, the basic idea is our species has always been migratory. Mm-hmm. We lived in small bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, we moved about every two months. And that is how we evolved. And then about 6,000 years ago, we started to seriously live in man-constructed structures. Mm -hmm. And as an architect, you'll understand that the fundamental notion of a secure structure is it protects you against nature. In other words, we were taken out of nature. We were taken out of the ecology. Mm -hmm. Our relationship changed fundamentally. We saw it as a threat rather than the place of bounty. Mm. And as a result, psychologically, we changed. Our behavior, our social relations, the way we dealt with strangers, and ultimately, we became domesticated. Yeah. And it is the journey of our domestication that I write about. That's great. I've been really interested in, in reading that. It always amazes me when people kind of say the great outdoors, you know, like it's this kind of wondrous... Sort Somewhere of we're not supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. You, you t- yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself, like this, just this way we've, we've created these structures around us. And, I mean, you and think about your, nature, you're born in a room, and you'll probably die in a room, mm. and 95% of your time is inside of one of these structures. Mm. I mean, you look around, where is nature in the place we are right now? There's no evidence of it at all. It's all gray. We're totally isolated. Yeah. And that has a huge impact. It's why people can't take climate change seriously. They're too disconnected yeah. from the outside. That's right. And we've all done it when we've had a, perhaps a night camping or sleeping under the stars, and it makes you feel pretty good. Having a, sitting next to a fire... That's where we're supposed you know, to be. Yeah. yeah, and sitting around, sitting around a fire, camping, looking at the stars. There's something just wonderfully, kind of natural. romantic and beautiful yeah. and natural about that, isn't there? And, we're, and and nowadays, unfortunately, with smog and pollution and light pollution, we're disconnected from the stars as well. Aren't we? we don't it, see. We them. are, and um, we're paying a huge price for that yeah. psychologically, uh, as well as physically. That mm. disconnection is not sustainable, yeah. and we're finding that out, and we're at a state of denial. Yeah. So, so sorry, Christopher, did you say it's out? or it's It is out. Right, okay. Yes. So you can get that. You can all, buy it on at Amazon.com. <laughs> Excellent. And, you, and so we search for Christopher G. Moore. G. Moore Rooms on right. Human Domestication and Submission. Uh, and um, I, I guess while we're talking to you, Christopher, um, is, the, is there a place where people can find you? Do you have a website that, where people can Yeah, I have. Uh, if you just, I guess, put my name, Christopher G. Moore, in Google, yeah, you'll find uh, my website should come up pretty much cool. at the top. All right, and we'll put it in the uh, put it in the show notes as well. Okay, uh, John, yeah. uh, have you do you got anything you want to promote? Anything new or anything exciting you're working on that you want to tell us about? Well, I always want to promote my last uh, six books with the yeah. sunshine, Ghibli cheap as a, as the star. Um, I can report that Netflix is option. I mean, it's been optioned forever by different. Um, companies but netflix have optioned it cool. and they um well i don't know people option things it's um it's heartbreaking they they they, they option and then they don't they don't make oh, okay. the movie but um i'm hoping netflix will will do something 
Netflix there's, Thailand or pardon Netflix Thailand? Will it be a Thai? Oh yeah, well yeah. It, it, it's um, it's the Netflix outfit in Singapore. It's okay. based in Singapore. They they do the whole region. Oh, there, w- will it be a Thai language? Thai production. Oh thing. yeah, it'll be it, yeah. It, it will go yeah. out in multiple languages. It's, oh, cool. The whole thing is it's it's like for the third world market because yeah. it's, these are these are third world stories. Yes. So if they do it, yeah. I mean, are you listening, Netflix? <laughs> yeah. And if you want to sponsor us, and we are looking for sponsorship, Netflix. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, wh- where can people see your work, John? Oh, you, you just just put my name out on on Google. I, I do have a web page, but people don't use it so much anymore because anyone who goes onto the web page or goes onto the Knopf page, are invited to join me on Facebook. So the vast majority of my cool. communication is on Facebook. Excellent. And James, where pe- where can people get hold of you? Um, Twitter, uh, James Newman BKK, and on Facebook and and we have a new This Strange Life Facebook now, don't we? Oh, we do. Yeah, we're just developing that at the moment, yeah, along with so, the YouTube channel so and this stay sort of tuned stuff. For that. So, um, let, let, we'll, we'll not promote that yet, then. But that, we'll just let just strangers that that is coming, and you can get hold of us at Strange Life This on Instagram and uh, Twitter, and uh, This Strange Dot Life on the uh, internet. And you can get hold of me on Twitter at Crypto Mickey. Uh, guys, this thank has you been, so much. It's been great. The time flew by, and I love some of the places we went: psychedelics and nature and pirates. <laughs> it was fantastic. And as I say, you know, if I didn't do this podcast, I would rarely get to speak to cool guys like you. And well, if we had another ten minutes, we could have got to the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, so I'm sure cowboy. Would, I'm sure we would have dissected that as well. Um, I mean, yeah. So thanks very much, guys. Cheers. And, uh, okay. Yeah, we'll see you later. See you Cheers. next week. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.
icons should be icons, shoot the icons, fuck the icons. Icons should be icons, shoot the icons, fuck the icons. Icons should be icons, shoot the icons, fuck the icons. <laughs>